Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Celestron Astromaster 130, a popular beginner's model towards the low end of Celestron's product line and one that I have been not recommending for many years now. I've seen many of these things brought up to me at Skywatches by beginners and families who purchase their first telescope and are looking to get into astronomy and unfortunately you have to find a way to break it to them that this thing just isn't very good. And judging by the mail that comes in here, many of you who are at Skywatches as well wind up in the same boat. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What is this thing? Well, if you stumbled across this channel, this is an astronomical telescope designed for looking up at the night sky. I have a mirror in the back. It's a 130 millimeter mirror, about 5.1 inches, operating at f5 for a focal length of about 650 millimeters. There's a secondary mirror here which deflects the light up into this. This is the focuser. You focus here to change magnifications. You change eyepieces. There are two eyepieces that come with the telescope. One is a 20 millimeter yielding around 32 power. And I think I got it down here. There is a 10 millimeter eyepiece down here yielding about 65 power. Now this is on a traditional German equatorial mount. If you've never seen one of these things before, this is shaped like this funny device for a reason. The reason is because all of the stars in the northern hemisphere appear to rotate around a point near Polaris, the North Star. If you're in the southern hemisphere, you don't have a south star. You have to figure something else out. So it stands to reason that if we point this axis, this one here, up towards Polaris, which is the North Celestial Pole, and we lock down the axes, you can, in fact, reach anything, point in the sky, by just setting it up like this. So we'll just go ahead and pretend it's here. If you do that, you can track the motions of the stars just by turning this knob here. Now, that's how it works in theory. In practice, we have some problems. And they start right away. Those of you who know telescopes, those of you who've been around for a while, immediately have identified what the problem is. It's the mount. It's always the mount. <laughs> in expensive telescopes, the problem is very rarely the optical tube. It's always the mount. Now, the deceptive thing here is it actually kind of looks decent. Cosmetically, I think this actually looks quite good. It's only when you start using it do you realize this thing is just extremely frustrating to use. It never seems like it's in balance. There are knobs here to lock down the right ascension and the declination axes, but they're either always too tight or they're always too loose. And it's just not steady. When you try to turn this in either one of these axes, it binds, there are dead spots, it's just not very smooth, and the mount is just plain going to frustrate you. If you were to somehow get past that, there are other issues as well. There is a red dot reflex site molded into the top here, and this is an older model. The newer models come with a better red dot sight finder, and if you have one of those, you're actually gonna be ahead of the game there, but this is one of the older models. I know what some of you are saying. How can you screw up a red dot? Believe me, they did it. The dot isn't even sharp. It's this mushy sort of red thingy, and there's actually two reflections in here. It's confusing. I guess you're supposed to line them up. This is consistent with other ones like this that I have seen before. Not only that, the red dot reflex sight is mounted extremely close to the tube, which means you're going to have to get your eye almost right onto the tube. You're going to be pressing your cheek against the tube. It's just not very comfortable. Get past that, and the focuser is also not very good. This one is pretty indicative of the other ones I've seen as well. There's an enormous amount of play in this, and there don't seem to be any adjustments in it. In other words, if you're going to try to focus on something, there is so much wobble in the focuser that even at low power, what you're focusing on is going to be shifting back and forth to the point where it's very difficult to draw a fine focus. Now, if you're unfortunate enough to put the higher power eyepiece in here, all of those problems get magnified. As you try to focus, the object you're trying to focus on actually will careen in and out of the field of view. You can't even see it all at all while you're focusing get past that, and there's yet another issue. This 20 millimeter eyepiece, this is the low power eyepiece, the one you're gonna be using the most often, is, well, it's pretty bad. This is the same 20 millimeter eyepiece that you see in many of the Astromasters and Power Seekers. It is an image erecting eyepiece. I have no idea why they did this. I think the idea is you're gonna be looking at terrestrial objects, but those of you who own one of these things will 
attest to this. You may do that once or twice. You're never going to do it again. In fact, this eyepiece with the PowerSeeker 127 that you saw me review earlier wasn't even working. The lens elements were loose. This one is working fine, but I would argue that's even worse because you're going to be tempted to use it. You know, Celestron makes and sells some really good products. Unfortunately, this isn't one of them. If you followed me, you know I'm fond of saying don't buy Astromasters or Power Seekers. They're just too far down the quality chain. They share some of the same parts and some of the same design philosophies, and they're just going to be frustrating for beginners. One of the ironies of our hobby is some of this beginner stuff is actually better suited for advanced amateur astronomers who know how to get around these things. So, but if you're patient and determined enough, you might be able to get this to work. So, You've seen me do this before. I will bungee cord a Rigel Quick Finder onto the end of a telescope so at least I have access to a finder of some kind. And if you wanted to, you could remove the optical tube from this horrible mount and put it on another mount like this. This is my Vixen Porta. You've seen me do, use this thing before. We're going to have to rotate the rings up like this, but I'll leave it like this for now. In this form, could we see things? Yes. We found the moon. We could see the rings of Saturn, but again, drawing focus at higher power is very difficult with that slop in the focuser there. M13 and M15 were two globular clusters that could be seen. M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, NGC 457, and a number of other objects. You might want to ask, how are the optics? They're not good. <laughs> There's a ton of spherical aberration on this thing. I wouldn't worry about it. You've got a lot bigger fish to fry than the quality of the optics. So I thought I'd show this real quick because this is the way it came to me and I'm always fascinated at what beginners do when they get a telescope like this. This is the stock 10 millimeter eyepiece. It's actually not that bad, but it's just a little bit too strong for both the optical tube and the mount. This 20 is awful. It's weird. It's got all these elements inside. There does appear to be a field stop just inside here, which may account for the drinking straw-like field of view. But this came with, and this is pretty indicative of the problems that beginners face and what they tend to do. We have the dreaded high power eyepiece, 6.7 millimeters, followed by the even more dreaded Barlow lens. And you know what the beginner is going to do. They're going to take the high power eyepiece and put it in the Barlow lens and make even more magnification out of it, right? So if it doesn't work, just keep throwing magnification at the problem. And of course, we all know that's the worst possible thing you can do. This is followed by the even more dreaded camera adapter. I really hope the owner did not try to use this thing. The mount is not secure. The axes have a tendency to flop over. The camera is going to present an unbalanced load. And in some cases, I have seen these mounts either flop over or the camera just fall out and smash to the ground. I will give the previous owner some credit here. At least they did not buy a set of those silly colored filters. So again, unfortunately, the items that we've discussed here, these problems are going to be most damaging to the beginner. We lose lots of newcomers to the hobby due to issues like the things that we've discussed. I keep coming back to the mount and its balance issues. It seems worse than it would seem because even when you balance the thing in both axes, it always seems to be off a little bit. Now, one night I left some guys playing with this out in the observing field, and when I came back some time later, I noticed they were still playing with the balance, and that's when I knew something was up, because the guy who was playing with it has a lot more experience than I do. So one day I was looking at this telescope from this orientation that you see here. Let me show you what I found. Here is a normal equatorial mount. Notice that the optical tube is centered on the declination axis. It looks like a giant lollipop. Here's the Astromaster. Notice how the optical tube has been shifted to the left, and that's the better part of an inch. Look at the orange plate and how it's not centered on the declination shaft. This accounts for why this thing always feels out of balance, even when you technically do have it balanced in RA and in declination. The comments from the guys were not good in the observing field. They were ranged from, this thing is good for gathering dust in the corner, to you should take it to the transfer station, to the best part of this thing is the Vixen compatible plate and the rings, I would agree with that. One person named this thing the Disaster Master 130. However, 
through the years, I have gotten a steady stream of messages from people who tell me the situation is salvageable as long as you're willing to do a couple of things. Number one, buy a used one. These things are $250 to $350 new. That is way too much money for the quality that you are getting. Get a used one. The Celestron sells a lot of these things, and if you find somebody who has one, you can usually buy it for pennies on the dollar, and it's not unusual to find these things given away. That's what's happened to me here. That's how it's found its way to me. Second, once you have the telescope, find an astronomy club or a member who has a mount that you can put it on. That way you can recreate the situation that I showed you out in the field. In fact, that's what happened during the review period. Club member Mike got a Celestron Power Seeker 80 EQ for free. He ditched the mount. The optical tube was actually okay. He put it on an equatorial mount and it's fine. Most of the optical tubes in the AstroMaster and Power Seeker lines are okay, with two exceptions. One, of course, is the Power Seeker 127. The other one is the AstroMaster 114 for the same reason. Both are Bird Jones optical designs that adds an extra layer of problems on top of everything that we've already discussed. So if you're willing to do those things, the situation could be salvageable. So there you have it, a look at the Celestron Astromaster 130, a telescope that, sadly, I still can't recommend. Hope you found this information useful. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.